Good to be here tonight. Good to have Paul Davis with us again. Uh, trust the Lord will bless him with us. And for those online, it's good to have you with us. So we're going to uh, turn to God in prayer. So let's pray. Our Father, as we again turn unto you and give you thanks for all your many mercies to us, we realize, Lord, that we are indebted to your grace and you were the one who has come to us when we were dead in our sin and you raised us up and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for our position and we thank you for our relationship with you, that we are the children of God. And we pray your blessing upon us again this night as we gather together to hear your word and to come and seek your face in prayer. So, Lord, draw near to each and every one of us that we might receive some encouragement from you. So hear us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, then we're going to sing, Spirit of Faith, come down, reveal the things of God and make to us the Godhead known and witness with the blood. Okay, let me just uh, give you some announcements. And as good as I have Paul, as I say this evening, just that the Lord would bless him and encourage him. And tomorrow at 4.30, the Explorers for primary school age children. And then on Saturday at 7 o'clock as Connect for those uh, in their 20s to 30s in Centre Point, opposite uh, Limitless Church in Morriston. And then on Sunday at 10.30 and 6 o'clock, we've got Morgan Britton with us. And then next Tuesday at 7 o'clock, there's impact for secondary school aged children in Mount Elam. And next Wednesday at 9.45, there's Little Lamb's Play Group on uh, Wednesday morning. So, as I say, it's good to have Paul with us, and uh, I'll hand it over to you, Paul. Thank you.
There you are. Great. Thank you so much for the invitation to be with you again. It's always a privilege to come up and join you. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Paul Davis. I'm an elder at Waterfront Community Church, and I'm a, an evangelist with Counties UK. Uh, Counties UK, uh, their motto is... Uh, to spread the gospel of Jesus uh, in the UK and to inspire the local church. And that's always been on my heart. And uh, for me, that's meant that whenever you have an excuse to share the gospel with someone, you take it. And uh, for us this year, it's uh, 10 years since we came back to Swansea after living in London for two years. And isn't it amazing how we have a plan and yet God has a totally different one. Uh, when we first got married, Laura and I said, well, we won't come back to Swansea now. We've done that. We can tick it off the list. And yet, a few years later, we found ourselves back in Swansea, working with churches and meeting with old friends and old acquaintances and seeing the work flourish here. Because it's true, isn't it, what it says in God's word, man uh, plans his way, but it's the Lord who establishes his steps. We come up with all sorts of plans and ideas that we have, but it's actually only the Lord who actually makes things happen. And so for 10 years, that's what we've been doing. We've been involved in uh, schools work, both in primary and secondary, uh, been part of children's groups and youth groups, been part of church missions and holiday clubs, all with one mission in mind, and that is to share the good news of Jesus uh, with those who will listen. We've also been part of beach missions as well. And it's a privilege to lead that team each year. And uh, again we have those young people who come on each and every single year. They come, they learn, they train how to share the gospel, and then they get to take those things home uh, with them. In fact, one, uh, this year, Isaac came on the team, who's my eldest, he's seven, and he came and stayed with the team for a whole week. And I tell you what, the impact it had on his life was truly amazing. Uh, after the evening service, he was so proud to come up to me. He went, Daddy, I read the Bible in the service with one of the girls on the team and I did it all by myself for the first time ever. He was so excited to be able to read the Bible. Please, would you continue to pray for our uh, boys? We have three boys, uh, Isaac, who's seven, Malachi, he's five, and Boaz is 10 months old. We're now at that stage where we're meeting with parents and meeting them at the school gate and things like that. And it's a wonderful opportunity to share with them um, what your job is and what you do. It's quite helpful when you have children called Isaac, Malachi, and Boaz. Uh, what's their names? Oh, that's interesting. Where does it come from? Oh, it comes from the Bible. Have you heard of the Bible? It's a, a good conversation starter. That's not why we chose the names, by the way. But it is a really good uh, conversation starter. Of course, during something, I don't know if it ever hit Kiddach, uh, but something called COVID happened and uh, it stopped a lot of churches and all our churches had to close and had to stop. And I don't know about you, but in those instances, you think, oh, well, that's it. It's all over. We can't go to schools anymore. We can't reach people's homes. We can't. But isn't it amazing how the Lord still works? Through videos and through Zoom, we, we all learned new skills, didn't we? At the very least. And so during that time, uh, myself and Phil Davis and uh, Steve Trocida, we're all counties evangelists here in Swansea, we came together and we started to develop assembly time, which is a simple video each week with a song which we would send out to, to local primary schools. To my amazement, again, the impact of videos and putting them online, I still, I don't know about you, I still think in locality, oh, that will go to Swansea, that will go to X amount of places. Amazingly, these videos have gone further than we've ever thought possible. These videos have gone to schools where we've never been invited in for one reason or another. Schools that we thought were closed doors, but they've been watching every video we have. In fact, my brother-in-law tells me he's a deputy head in, uh, in Cardiff, and he tells me we're famous in Cardiff as well. I said, how is that possible? He said, oh, well, I've just downloaded every single video you had and I've been putting it in my school every week. So the children feel like they know you really well. Isn't that amazing? These things just go out. The very moment we thought we had to lock the doors and no one would hear the gospel, that's the moment where Jesus changes things. And so now we did it for secondary schools as well. We developed that called Just a Thought 
and I also developed a, a podcast um, taking people's uh, life stories and I made an evangelistic podcast called Legacy Tales Podcast, which is still going today. And again, it's reaching more people than I ever thought possible. Why? Because man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Of course, we're now in a world where we now have to go back to what we used to do. And I, it's a wonderful thing. As much fun as it's been talking to a camera, as easy as it's been to record it, edit it, send it out, and then six weeks later do it all again and not have to travel, it's brilliant to be back in local schools. It's a, an amazing feeling to stand at the front of an assembly, to meet with the children and to share with them uh, the message of Jesus. In fact, I had the privilege of uh, doing a lot for the Jubilee and did a lot of Jubilee uh, assemblies. And it amazed me the amount of messages I got back because I did it in our, in our boys' school. And I had messages back from uh, parents to say, I just want to let you know, uh, my boy never listens in school. He's a hard boy. But he remembered every single word you said in the assembly. He told me word for word of what you said. Let's pray for our children. Let's pray for our children. Let's pray for our local school. Let's pray into our situations that the Lord will not only help them to remember. And as much as I'd love them to remember me, that's very flattering. Would you pray that they'd remember him and remember the message of the assemblies as well? We've had the privilege now of restarting Kicks as well, which is our little uh, Christian union that's in Kumtawe. Of course, post-COVID, we had a large group. Now that large group have all grown up and have all left Kumtawe, and so we've had to start again. And when we started, we didn't have many. And we all got very disheartened, and myself and Rachel and Stefan, what are we going to do? Well, the only thing we could do really was pray. Pray for children to come. Pray for staff to help us to encourage the children to come. Amazingly, we had a report today, uh, yes, as, yeah, this morning, I should say, from Stefan. He went in yesterday. There is now six children who are going every single week. Five of which, uh, we, as far as we're aware, do not go to church at all. But they are consistent and they are coming every single week. One boy uh, goes to a local church in Neath, we've just discovered. He knows his Bible. He's a very shy boy. He's not someone who's going to broadcast and tell the world what he's doing. But the Lord is clearly working uh, in his life. As I said, the Lord, uh, sorry, man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Please continue to pray for uh, Kumtawi. We've got assemblies coming up for Christmas. It's a wonderful opportunity again to be able to share the message of Christmas, not just with the pupils, but with the staff as well, who get so sucked up into the buying the presents and trying to organize school events, they forget what it's all about. Please continue to pray uh, for those opportunities as well. If you'd like to find out more, I send a newsletter out and one is due out to come out in the next week or so and I'd love to give one to you. So if you'd like to have one, uh, I send it by email normally. So please send me your email address and I'd love to give one to you. But for now, let's come to God's word, shall we? We're going to look at Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. If you have your Bible with you, or if you want to turn it on, or look at the screen here, we're looking at Acts chapter 12, and I'm going to start reading at verse 1. Acts chapter 12 reads like this. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on them who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he'd seized them, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him, saying, 
get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. But he thought he was seeing a vision. When he had passed the first and second guard, he came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for him on its own accord. And they went out and went along one street. And immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. And when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked the door of the gateway, a servant girl called Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice, in her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it is an angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they, were, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And he said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was lit no little disturbance among the soldiers over what, become of, what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and did not find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to, get to death. Then he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chambermaid, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On the appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an or oration to them. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God and not a man, immediately. An angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem and they completed their service bringing with them John whose other name was Mark the grass with us the flower fades but thank God that his word stands forever let's pray shall we let's pray together heavenly father I simply want to thank you for this time to be together as your people Thank you, Lord, that we could be together here tonight and we can be found online as well. That, Lord, we can be joined together as one family to praise your name and to look at your word. And I simply ask that, Lord, as we come to look at your word, that if there's any distractions in our hearts or in our minds, that, Lord, you'd help us to push those things aside. That, Lord, we can truly focus on your word, I pray. For your glory's sake, I ask it. Amen. Amen. I love reading the book of Acts. If ever you want to know what mission is truly all about, if you want to know what the mission of the church is all about, read Acts. It is encouraging, it's inspiring, and it shows us how to tell people about him and how we can do it. I heard a wonderful story just the other day of a soldier during the American Civil War who was so distressed about what was happening, he found himself in a nearby park, wondering what to do next. He was desperate to talk to the president. And in his distress, a little boy approached him. And the little boy asked him what was wrong. And the soldier, for some reason, blurted everything out told this little boy everything. The little boy said, 
I know what to do. He took the soldier by the hand and he led the way through the park towards the White House. As they approached the White House, the amazing thing was they didn't go through the front door like he was expecting. They went round the back. And as they went round the back, they actually had to go past some soldiers. And to the soldiers' amazement, the guards just parted ways and let this little boy through. They went through the back door of the the White House. They went bursting through the corridors and they went bursting through the door of the Oval Office. And this soldier was thinking, what on earth is this little boy doing? And as they burst through the doors, the president span round and said, hello, boy. What can I do for you? Hello, son. How can I help you? You see, that boy had a different relationship with the president of the United States. And because of that little boy, that soldier was able to burst through the doors and go and speak to the president directly himself. Friends, tonight we are going to look at this simple phrase, the power of prayer. You see, just as that little boy was able to burst through the doors, friends, you and I have a wonderful opportunity. Not just even here on a Wednesday night, but in our very homes as well. You and I have an opportunity to pray and talk to our commander in chief. We don't have to come up with a, a certain code word or knock the door in a certain way. We can just burst into his presence like that child bursting in to the Oval Office. How wonderful is that? You and I get to talk to God on his throne, at the throne room of grace. And we can do it as simply as a child talks to their father. Acts chapter 12 makes it very clear. There are seasons of life that are difficult. Have a look at verse 1. And at that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on them who belonged to the church. You see, this isn't an easy time for those who are living in the book of Acts. They're going through a stressful and serious time. The authorities are out to get them. They want to suppress and to block and to push Christianity out of their country altogether. Does it sound familiar? Herod kills James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he sees that it pleases the crowd, when he sees it pleases the Jews, he's going to do it to Peter as well. And this was during the days of unleavened bread. But notice what the church does. Verse 5 says this, and it's my first point. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. That's my first point, is about earnest prayer. The situation is not good. King Herod is engulfed with rage, wielding his power of authority to destroy Christianity with all the physicality and brutality that he can. Notice Peter is arrested and it's made clear that King Herod's going to make a good spectacle out of this next one. Just note, like any other good politician, when they see something that's been received as popular, they'll do it again and again. And again. And this was done during the days of unleavened bread. The seven days following the Passover meal. These days were considered holy. And could not be desecrated by an execution. Hence the fact that Peter is not immediately killed. But taken away to prison. To wait out the week. And then the big spectacle can begin but what's the reaction of the church 
does the church go into panic mode? Do they have crisis meetings? Do they have committees of what on earth are we going to do next? No. The reaction of the church is to pray. An earnest prayer at that. You see, I don't know about you, but when it comes to prayer, we sometimes see prayer as passive. As an evangelist who goes out and goes out to schools and goes out to meet people and goes to talk to people, sometimes prayer seems passive. You've got to stop. You've got to slow down. You've got to spend time in the quiet instead of the constant action. But listen, without times of prayer, nothing happens. It's true, isn't it? How many times have we as a church, how many times have we tried to do something in our own strength and we fall into the first hurdle? Why? Because we try to do it in our own strength. How many times have we seen something just like kicks? I don't know where it's going to go. We weren't sure how it was ever going to grow. I tell you, prayer changes things. Without prayer, nothing truly ever happens. In his book, Serve Without Sinking, a chap called John Hindley, and I highly recommend his book, he comments on a passage from Mark 9. Mark 9 reads like this, Later the disciples asked their Lord, Why could we not drive it out? He replied, This kind can only come out by prayer. I'm sure you remember that passage as Jesus sends them out two by two to go and preach the gospel and share the kingdom of God. Their one request, Lord, why couldn't we heal that one? Why couldn't we do anything with that one? So John Henley comments with this line. They had used all their gifts, all their skills, and all their efforts, but they hadn't done the only thing that would work. Prayer. It's good, isn't it? They'd used all their gifts, all their skills, and all their efforts, but they hadn't done the only thing that would work. Prayer. I'm always amazed by heroes of the faith. I love reading church history and reading Christian biographies. And I came across Billy Bray, who was an evangelist in the tin mines. Billy was physically building the church evangelizing and then working down in the mines. That was his day. One night on his way home, before they went to bed, his wife said, Billy, we have no more money left. So they did the only thing that would work. They prayed about it. The next morning, Billy was on his way to the mines when somebody stopped him and put 10 pounds in his hand on his way to work. As Billy then went to build the church that evening, he met a man in need. So he gave him five pounds. After Billy had spent some time physically building the church, he then went on his way home, back to his home. He saw someone else in need, and he gave him five pounds as well. As he burst through the doors of his house, he said, Wife, the Lord has provided. She said, Oh, hallelujah. He said, Yes, but I've already given it away. I tell you, the faith of Billy is one thing. But I tell you this, the faith of his wife must have been even greater. That night, they prayed again for the Lord to provide. The next morning, Billy went to work and somebody came past him and gave him 20 pounds. Isn't that amazing? Prayer changes things. As the old hymn writer put it, have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Why? Because we can take it to the Lord in prayer. Friends, I wonder, are we earnest with our prayers? Are we convinced? Do we know within ourselves that we know that God can answer? 
And he will answer in his own way, in his own time. Friends, I'm not saying that when we pray, we should pray and God will give us whatever we've asked for. Otherwise, we'll all be outside uh, with our Porsches and our Volkswagens. I always remember that song, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? My friends all have Porsches. I just want to make amends. But I do know this, that when we pray, God does answer. It might not be in the way that we expect. It might not be in the way that we thought best. But God does answer prayer. And that's my second point. My second point is that God answers prayer. Because we read in verse 6. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains and sentries before the door. We're guarding the prison. What time is it? It is literally the 11th hour. The church have been praying for a whole week for God to release Peter, for something truly miraculous to happen. And when does it happen? Literally at the last minute. The very night before Herod's about to bring Peter out and make a spectacle out of him, the Lord answers the prayer. It truly amazes me that Peter sees the angel. He sees him break the chains. He leads him past the guards who have fallen asleep. He takes him past the gate. The gate swings open. And during the whole thing, Peter is thinking to himself, oh, this is the best dream I've ever had. But the amazing thing is, it's not a dream. It's reality. How? Because God answers prayer in a real, powerful, dynamic, and unexpected way. So when we pray, let's remember who it is we're praying to. When we pray, let's remember we're praying to the God who created all things. Who sustains all things. Who brings salvation. Who brings and releases men and women and boys and girls. And brings them out of the kingdom of darkness into his glorious light. That's the God we come to. Not the God who is distant and far away. Not the God who doesn't understand our problems. We come to the God who is close and near to those who call on him. Hallelujah. What a saviour we have. That's why it's important when we come to prayer, we reflect on God's character. We reflect on who he is. Before we bring our requests, we thank him for who he is. How many times have we come to pray and we've come with our shopping list? Morning God, here's the list. I need this, we need this. It could be great if you did that. How does Jesus help his disciples to pray? He tells them, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. He helps them to get the perspective. Reflect on who he is. Then come with your requests. And know that God will answer. Thank God that when we pray tonight, and we pray big prayers for our family and for our friends, for our community, for our schools, for our church. Thank God tonight that when we come to him, his storehouses are full. They are abundant with treasure, with gifts, with talents, with resources, and with the grace that we need. There's not a moment that goes by when Nigel prays and the Lord replies, I'm awfully sorry, Nigel, I'm out of courage today. Come back tomorrow, I might have some more in. No, his storehouses are full to bursting. Scripture tells me he will supply us with all our needs in his riches in Christ Jesus. We need to be a people who pray earnestly 
and expectantly, knowing that he will answer. And listen, have a look at verse 11. When Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent an angel and has rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people who were expecting. Listen, if the Lord can do that, then there is nothing our God cannot do. The children's song's got it spot on, hasn't it? My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. There is nothing my God cannot do. The third thing I want to share with you tonight is found in verse 12. The effect of prayer. Verse 12 reads like this. When he, Peter, realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And when he knocked on the door of the gateway, a servant girl called Rhoda came to answer the door. What is Peter's response to being set free? He runs and reports back to the church, the very church who were earnest in prayer for Peter to be released. This next section looks like a comedy sketch, doesn't it? The very church that had been praying earnestly that, Lord, will you please set Peter free? I'm here. Hello. The girl goes to answer the door, and she's so excited that Peter's at the door, she doesn't answer the door, she runs back in and tells them all. And what's their response? Ah, can't be Peter. You must be out of your mind. I tell you, it's him, he's at the door. You can't be him. Perhaps it's his ghost, it's angel or something. They are so earnest in their prayers for Peter to be released, they didn't believe that God could actually answer the prayer. And we could be the same, can't we? We pray a prayer, we hear somebody pray a prayer, and we say, oh, that's too big. That's too trivial. That's too extraordinary for God to do. Friends, I believe in a God who answers prayer. It may not be to my timing or to my schedule or to my plans, but I tell you, he answers prayer every time. As a student, I was on the Christian Union Committee and I was the evangelism secretary, would you believe? And we had a president who was new to the faith. He was fairly young. His name was Nick. And he had all these ideas of the things he wanted to do, and we didn't click at all. So I started to pray. Because I believe in a God who answers prayer. So I prayed for Nick. I prayed, Lord, would you sort him out? Lord, would you change him? Lord, you need to deal with him. You need to soften his heart. You need to change him, Lord. Do you know what the amazing thing is? Is that over the next few months, God did answer that prayer. But God didn't change Nick at all. He changed me. Why? Because I came to see him who he truly was. He was a brother in Christ. Yes, he was young in the faith. Yes, he went to a different church than me. But I could see that the Lord was using him. And using him in that role. It wasn't the way I expected. It wasn't on my schedule. But the Lord does answer prayer. So what is the response of the church then? This answered prayer. When they finally realize it is Peter who's at the door. In verse 17. They are shocked to see him. They are truly amazed. They must have been whooping and cheering with so much excitement. And in verse 17, Peter tells them, Shh, they still could be after me. They let him in. Peter describes to them how the Lord had brought him out of prison. And then he tells them, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And then they departed and went to another place. The response of the church was to praise and to worship and to celebrate what God has done. They listen to Paul's testimony 
and then they go and share that story. They go and see James and the other brothers. But look what ultimately happens at the end of verse 24. The word of God increased and multiplied. King Herod had all these amazing plans of how he was going to destroy Christianity right there and then. He'd already got rid of one. He was about to get rid of the leader, the very one who was in charge of this whole operation. And the Lord dealt with him swiftly. But not even King Herod could stop the word of God from reaching people. And the same is still true today. People heard the gospel. Lives were transformed. The church expanded and the gospel spread like wildfire. And friends, the truth is there is nothing and no one that can truly stop the word of God even today. Not even a pandemic. The word of God increased and multiplied. That's what we can take hold of. That's what can encourage us. Whatever happens in this next week, whatever season you are going through, family, personally, as a church, whatever the situation, let us be those who pray earnestly, knowing that God does and can and will answer prayer in his own way, in his own timing. And thank God, ultimately, his word will increase. It'll spread across Wales again. It'll go across the nations once again. And we are called to simply play our part in that as well. Amen. Amen. Before we have our uh, time of prayer, before I hand over back to Nigel for that time of prayer. We're going to sing a song together. We're going to sing, What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grieves to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to the Lord in prayer. Let's stand and sing together.
I believe those online are about to depart from us now. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this evening. And let me pray before you leave us tonight. Heavenly Father, we simply want to thank you that we could be together, together again tonight. Thank you, Lord, that we come to the God who comes and answers our prayers. Whether it's trials or temptations, whether we're weak or heavy laden, Lord, thank you that it is a privilege to bring everything to you in prayer. Heavenly Father, would you use us and would you bless us and help us, Lord, to play our part in spreading the gospel to those who listen in our community, here and online as well. Use us, Lord, I pray, for the sake of your kingdom. Amen. Amen.